Hello out there, you beautiful people. Welcome to Athletepreneur. Listen, I'm so damn excited about this. I can't even go to sleep last night. Thank you for being here. I know it's a Saturday. Um, you could be doing a million other things right now, but you're here with us. And that means the world to me. This event, and this is the reason why I couldn't sleep last night, because we got a fire lineup. We're going to get right into it. I don't want to waste too much time. I want you to hear from everybody. You might want to get your notepads ready, because it's about to be some gems being dropped on this show, especially if you are a current athlete, a former athlete. The main purpose behind this, and this is the first of many Athletepreneur events. Right now, we got to make do and do it virtually. Eventually, the goal is to have in-person events where former athletes who are doing big things in the world can come together, can chop it up, share ideas, help each other grow. The purpose of this is for you guys to understand. I want you to listen up, all you current athletes, all you former athletes. A lot of you have been impacted by your season being canceled. I want you to understand that you don't have to just settle for whatever job you can get. And I want you to hear yourself in the stories of the people who are about to share with you. Listen for your experience. Listen to what life was like for them once they graduated or once they finished their professional careers athletically and what they did to navigate and carve out a lane for themselves. This is what Athletepreneur is about, is carving out a lane for yourself. Not settling for what you can get, not letting people tell you, hey, you're an athlete, you should go into sales. Or you're an athlete, you should be a coach. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those careers, but if you, if you know me, anybody who knows me, I always say don't settle for those things. Those are great careers, but I want you to think bigger. I want you to listen to what these people are telling you. Everybody on this panel does something different and they carve out a lane for themselves and they're doing something unique, something that's true to them, okay? So this is not scripted. There's no, I don't have any questions. We're just chopping it up. This is about sharing. So get your notes ready because we got someone to open this up that's gonna blow your socks off. So I hope you're ready, all right? Joy Walker, and I consider this woman to be Joy Walker is like a sister to me. All right, so I'm gonna give her a brief intro, but then we're gonna get right into it. So Joy Walker is a native of St. Louis and a former member of the women's basketball team at South Carolina State University. She recently founded the Six Figure Athlete, which is a course that teaches athletes how to build and scale their own businesses. Say what now? We're gonna dive into that, please believe. Joy is also the, also the host of Sets for Life podcast, where she has interviewed well over 100 former athletes. I had the privilege to be on that show. Shameless plug, please go check, check out that episode. And Joy is also the author of The Sweet Spot, Finding Your Purpose in Life After Sport. Please welcome Joy Walker to Athletepreneur. Taj, thank you so much for having me and thank you for that incredible introduction. I am excited. I already took some notes, like you wasted no time. So let's get into it. <laughs> hey, hold on. I just dropped my notepad. Let me get mine ready. I, I got mine right here. Let's Let's go. Let's okay, go. Okay. All right. Here we go. I'm working on the little one today, but uh, I'm going to keep flipping through the pages because I might be through this by the time you and I get done talking. Oh, so, my goodness. Let's just dive right into it. You know, we're, we're not here to talk about stats and what our, you know, our college career was like. Yeah. We're here to talk about the path that you've been able to carve out for yourself mm -hmm. since graduating. So mm -hmm. let's just start at the point where you graduated from South Carolina State, right? And you already had a position lined up, correct? I did not. Okay. You are you already were on a path where you knew what you wanted to do somewhat, right? Or at least you thought so. Not really. I mean, I, okay. I went to school okay. for accounting, but my story is kind of crazy. We can get into it if you want to. You just let me know. Oh, please go ahead. Tell me about it. You walk across the stage and then what happens? I walk across the stage. I go back home to St. Louis. Uh, a lot of us, we, we scramble to find someone else to touch our identity to. And like you were saying, a lot of athletes going to sales, going to coaching. <laughs> I can relate. I went into coaching, right? So I get this volunteer job, not getting paid, but I'm around basketball, so I'm happy, right? So here I am with a bachelor's degree in accounting, which is not some basket we be like, not an easy degree. So I got a decent degree, uh, but I find myself at FedEx overnight loading trucks for $9 an hour, right? Mm. So that's the first maybe six plus months out of um, undergrad. So then I was like, okay, this isn't going to work. I didn't go to school to work at FedEx and load trucks and volunteer to coach uh, a basketball team. So I was like, okay, I got to go to grad school. So I knew if I took too much time off, I wasn't going back. So I went to grad school, got my master's in accounting. I was in Atlanta. I had an internship with the Atlanta Hawks and you could not tell me a thing, right? I'm an intern with the NBA franchise. I'm about to have my master's in accounting. I'm just like, life is sweet. Life is good. Graduation rolls around again. I find myself back in St. Louis on the couch, this time unemployed, graduated in May, did not get a single job offer until September of that year. So we're talking about months on the couch. 
Um, from there, went into accounting, worked in accounting and hated it. Uh, so returned to basketball again. So got into coach and started coaching at the junior college level, uh, got to the D1 level, but then started to realize that it's so much bigger than getting kids ready for game day. Um, and that's where the book started and the podcast started. So got out of coaching and got into more of an administrative role as an academic advisor, life skills coordinator, you name it, I did it. But there was still something in me that said, Joy, you you got to do more. Um, So about a year ago, I took the leap. I dove into entrepreneurship full time. And this past year has been so crazy. I was like, I can't have this information and sit on it. So now I'm all about teaching athletes how to build their own business. Mm, and that's where the six figure athlete comes in. That's right? where it is, because I feel okay. like I feel like we're so conditioned to go chase that six figure job. And why do that? Why wait until I'm 35, 40, whatever to get that six figure? Why not just create a business that can make you multiple six figures that can make you potentially millions? You know, and I think that as athletes, we all whether we want to admit it or not, we wanted to play pro ball because we wanted that big check. Like we didn't we didn't play sports because we wanted to be average. We wanted to have some average salary. So why settle? Like you said, why just settle for the first job that comes along? Why not take the amazing skill set that you have as an athlete and build a business? It just makes too much sense. So that's why I got the six figure athlete. Mm, six figure, yeah. Go I was ahead, gonna say, bad, I go feel ahead. like six figures should be the floor and not the goal. So that's that's where we start. Like with the skill Come set on, we man. have, with the way that we we grind, that's the floor. That's where we start. That's not the goal anymore. Right. Preach. Now, I don't want to I don't want to offend anybody who's a non athlete on here. Like, oh, they think they're so special because they play <laughs> sports. But at the end of the day, what we had to do to get to that point, not only to play there, but to stay there and to graduate or even to go on and play professionally, the schedule required to do that. We've been through something that not too many people can relate to. It's the same thing with the military, right? If you think about mm -hmm. that, that's why you hear the tra military transition being compared to athletic transition a lot, mm -hmm. because you gotta be you gotta be cut from a different type of cloth and those skill sets, definitely. And that's why we're here to talk about that, right? Take me back to the point where, so you're on the couch, right? <laughs> Obviously we've all been there. For me, I was, I was back home in my childhood bedroom looking at all my little trophies and, top water and stuff. <laughs> You know, I'm 22, 23 years old. Like, come on now. Come on. There's got to be more to life than this. Yes. This is not what I saw for myself. But take me back to that moment. And what is it that, would you say that was rock bottom for you? Rock bottom. The very bottom. <laughs> yes. Okay. So what was it that had you make the shift and say, okay, I'm here. But you started carving out a lane for yourself. What was the shift that happened where you were just like, I'm going to get up. I'm going to stop feeling sorry for myself. And I'm going to make a move. So really two things happened. I'm going to be totally transparent with you. So I graduated in May, moved back home because I literally couldn't afford my apartment in Atlanta anymore. So I moved back home. I don't have a job. Mind you, I'm going on interviews. I'm asking my dad for gas money to get to the interview. I literally, I had a phone bill coming up, right? I was, this was, I was 23 years old, 23 years old. I got a phone bill coming up. I don't have the money to pay for my phone bill. So I start mm. looking around my room and I was like, yo, Joe, you need to have a yard sale. So you need to sell, you, you need to make some money. Like you don't have a job. So I literally, everything I didn't need, didn't want, I promise you, I made about $700 in like two hours at my yard sale, right? I, I took the last $20 in my bank account. I went and made flyers. I walked around my neighborhood for hours the day before, handing out flyers, made $700 in two hours, right? Wow. And so that was that was the first because I had always like sold CDs, like I'd always done little things or whatever. DJ, like trying to I had the entrepreneurial spirit, but I hadn't really identified it. But the yard sale was the first thing that really made me it made it click like, dang, OK, if I have some sort of product or if I have an event or if I have a service, people will come and they'll pay me money. So that happened. But also at the same time, we're talking about I have we're talking about from May to September. Right. I have all of this spare time. Yeah, I'm filling out job applications. But in the meantime, I was at the library every day, every other day. So I'm reading. I felt like everything I had learned up until that point was a lie because I went to school. I worked hard. But where was my good job? Like I was applying. I just couldn't find what I was looking for. So I'm like, OK, everything that I was told might not be legit, might not be the best advice. So I started seeking out new advice. So this is where I read rich dad, poor dad. This is where I read. Every, I literally read 40 books that summer. Everything wow. on entrepreneurship, business, 
personal, I went on a binge. So between me having that yard sale and something clicking in my head and reading books and really renewing my mind, I haven't been the same person since then. Now it took me a while because I did have different jobs. I did, you know, climb the corporate ladder, whatever, but now it's just, it's all really coming together. And I just love what you're doing because like you said earlier, athletes have this incredible skill set. You got to be kind of crazy to play college ball. You play football, so that's a different level, right? I cannot relate. But in order to get up at 5 a.m., let coaches talk to you crazy, like we go through some, you got to be kind of crazy to play college ball. And you got to be kind of crazy to be an entrepreneur. And the two just kind of go together. Mm, well said. Well said. I love it. I love it. So talk to me about once you had the idea, once the light bulb went off through the yard sale and 700 bucks in two hours, you know, that's impressive, especially you, you out there passing out flyers and stuff, yeah. getting it out the mud, you know, mm -hmm. you know, uh, talk to me about like, what was the point where you realize, okay, now that I can do this, when did you start getting clear on how you wanted to do it, um, the need you wanted to solve, right. Which I'm sure we'll get into. That's what being a business owner, that's what entrepreneurship is finding a need, solving it, adding mm -hmm. value to whoever the target audience is. How did you, develop the vision for, okay, I specifically want to give back and work with former athletes? I think it came through my work. Um, I think, and Barbara Corcoran said something years ago, I'll never forget. She said, most business ideas are not sexy. It's not like you come up, oh, you're just walking down the street and it hits you. I, it, it's not like that. What you do is you look within your current industry and you find the gap. Right. So when I was at a low point, when I was sitting on the couch, I'm thinking I had athletes have a lot of pride. So I'm thinking I'm the only one who's hurting like this. I'm the only one who's missing basketball. I'm the only one who's unemployed. But then I got into coaching. Right. And I saw 15 little me's in that these young ladies were so focused on game day, so focused on next season that they weren't interning. They weren't building relationships with professors. And I'm like, oh my God, the cycle repeats itself. And I think that it was sort of twofold in that I saw the gap. I was able to work with students who I wasn't that much older than. Um, and I was really able to like, okay, what would I want to be done differently? But then at the same time, after, if you, you know, if you work in athletics or really anywhere, there's just a lot of unnecessary red tape and things like that. And when you have a mission that is, and I, I'm biased, but when you have a mission that is pure, when you really just want to help people, but then you have all these systems and things that are in place that sort of prohibit you from doing what you're doing, it literally forced me out. Because you sometimes you get to a point where it's like, I want to do these things. I want to help these people, but I don't want to have to schedule a meeting or ask you for permission or I, that I'm just not wired that way. And I really, really tried to be a great employee for years, but I, I'm a terrible employee. And I'll say that, like, I just, <laughs> I, I, I want to do my own thing. And that's just how I think a lot of athletes are wired. And I think this event is so important because so many of us just aren't exposed to the possibilities. We don't necessarily know entrepreneurs. We haven't seen, our, we just see our mom, dad, grandma, aunts, uncles, get up, go to work, come home, complain about it and do it for 40 years. And that's all we know. We don't know any other options. Mm, that's right. And we're so fortunate to live in this time of abundance, like you said, where you don't have to go that route. There's nothing wrong with working a corporate job. But at the end of the day, if you're unhappy with it, then you got to do like Joy did. You got to do like I did. It's like, OK, I know this path is not the path for me. So I'm going to start looking for opportunities and identifying ways that I could carve out my own path. Now, it's not going to happen overnight. I want to make that super clear to no. her Joy getting it out the mud, passing out flyers, doing what she had to do working the job and spending her free time actually building something, something mm -hmm. sustainable. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the process, you know, actually building. Some people say journey. I call it a process. A journey sounds like you just, woo, you know, <laughs> just along for the ride. But a process is like, no, I get up every day and I'm doing this, this, and this. You're setting your own schedule. You're mapping out, you know, your next steps. You Only you know what you need to do to put yourself in position or seeking out people who can guide you. But talk to me about the process of actually once you had the idea, once you saw the gap, what, ha what has that process been like for you since then? I think we're so fortunate as athletes. I think it is so important to take what made you successful as an athlete and use it in life. I don't think that you should graduate from college. And now because and like you said on my on my podcast, which I'll never forget, a lot of athletes like they put on weight because nobody is blowing the whistle for them at 6 a.m. anymore. Right. Just because you don't have coach in your ear doesn't mean you can't hold yourself accountable. So when I got the idea for my book, I was literally 
two or three weeks into my first job as a division one assistant coach, right? Super demanding, working around the clock, recruiting. Like you, you like, I got my dream job, quote unquote, but I had an idea for this book. So what did I do? I got up at 4 a.m. every morning. Okay, get up, get up early like you used to get up early, carve out that time, whether it's time to work out, whether it's an hour to work on my book. And I knew that every Sunday was our off day. So even if most people are watching Netflix or they want to relax. No, I literally would sit downstairs on my laptop. My phone would be upstairs on silent so I couldn't see it for four, five, six hours at a time. And I just knocked it out. I when I was coaching, I took so much pride in my practice plans. Like it was deep. I literally had an Excel spreadsheet. I would pull drills. I had them in different categories. Like it was kind of ridiculous. But like I take a lot of pride <laughs> in preparing for practice. I, I run my life the same way. I literally have three to do lists right here. Like I'm breaking my days up the same way. Coach, like your coach was successful. Because they didn't just come to practice and say, all right, guys, uh, they had the, the teams decided before practice started. They knew what drills, what time. So why are you going through life and just sort of like, uh, I don't know. No, you have to be intentional. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur, that's another level of accountability. I don't have a paycheck coming in just because I showed up somewhere. I, if I don't go kill it, I don't eat. But you have to... <laughs> You have to have, and we already have it. We have the discipline. We we understand how to persevere, but you got to be structured. And if you need an accountability partner, if you need a new coach, go do that. But you really already have what it takes to be an entrepreneur and you just have to tap into it. Wow. So you almost fell out of my seat at one point. I had to, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't want to embarrass myself and fall out, my, fall out of my seat on camera. Uh, one thing that stood out to me when you were, well, many things stood out to me but one thing in particular is not only did you outline the work ethic the grind that it takes but i love that you drew a parallel between the detail and the energy you put into your practice plans mm -hmm. right because i think that so many people know they want more know they want a better life but and i'm talking to you former athletes right now or anybody who's in a job right now who they're just not satisfied with not only did you realize the work it took but you were like if i put in this much effort over here why would i not Put that effort in over Come here Come and build on. out my own lane, Come right? On. So a lot of you guys, you know, you don't want to be late to work because you know you don't get written up, but you won't be on time for that that time you blocked off on your schedule where you mm. said you were going to work on your business, you were going to work mm. on your book, you were going to launch the podcast. Another thing you and I really discussed is uh, on on your episodes, particularly when I was on there, we talked about consistency. So it's mm. not just the one and done. Like you feel good because you set your alarm for five a.m. and woke up one day. And now you think you're supposed to have a business overnight. One of the things we talked about, you you have interviewed over 100. Aren't you at like 120 something by now? Episode like 135. Yeah. Okay. And I was on like episode 75. And just so that's almost, you know, double the amount. And just to see the exponential growth that's happened from that time to this time. So it's about the consistency as but well. But then you got to think about like, I'm a, I love numbers. I love podcasting. You think about if you go on iTunes, I bet you, I couldn't even guess how many podcasts there are, right? The average mm -hmm. podcast fizzles out at episode 17. Mm. People stop at episode 17. They aren't consistent. And I've, I've had an episode up until September because I've taken a little sabbatical from the podcast. I had an episode every single Monday for two and a half years. Most people won't do that. And that's just one lane. That's I, I as an athlete, as a former coach, as an administrator, I, I've lived in this world with athletes for so long. There's only one way to be successful. And it is, cons I don't care if it's the way I tie my shoe in the morning. I don't care if it's when I record my, po like I am and people who like just meet me. They think that I'm so strange, but I'm like, I got to check. I get one shot at this life. And if I don't take it serious, if I'm not consistent, if I'm not showing, if I, I'm not about talking, I'm really not. I want results. So we got to, like I said, I'll say it a million times, that same mindset, that same work ethic, that same, con like, think about how consistent you had. I was not the best player on my AAU team. I'll tell you that right now. I played on a club team growing up that was stacked. I don't think any of my teammates got more reps in than I did. Like if there were 15 of us on that team, maybe 
four or five of us played D1, I was not the most talented, but I, at nine, 10, 11 years old, I was outside with my basketball every day because I wanted it. I watched Lisa Leslie. I watched Michael Jordan. I watched Cheryl, Cheryl Swoops. I wanted to be them. And I knew that even if I, and the same thing works in business, okay? You don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to be the sweetest. You might not have been the most talented player on your team, but if you showed up, if coach knew you were consistent, you were getting minutes. Life works. There are so many parallels between life and, and sports, between sports and business. Like all you got to do is take these skills and figure, okay, how can I use this in my new venture? Wow. Wow. All right, folks. Is your notepad full? Because mine is, folks. <laughs> All right. If it's not, you must not be you must not be paying attention. You're not hearing what Joy is telling you right now. All right. Now, another thing that I appreciate about you is that you were humble enough when you started out on your journey. And you and I have, have had many conversations about this. You were humble enough through this process to be like, I don't know everything. Mm-hmm. You know, so just because I have a lane carved out for myself and I'm I'm setting out on a path. It doesn't mean that I have to try to go into lone wolf mode and try to figure it out. And it mm-hmm. took me so long to snap out of that. I know you 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 caught on a lot quicker than I did. I was trying to, you know, a one man show. I'm over here doing this, doing that. And yeah. I think it's detrimental to long term success. Okay. Mm-hmm. You talk about what it's like for you uh once you had the path carved out. What is it like? Uh what what was your process, I guess, of tapping in to people looking for mentors, virtual mentors, or, you know, people you knew in your network, what is, what are some, what's some advice you could give to a current or former athlete who is looking for guidance? How would you go about that? Well, if it comes to starting, let's just say specifically they want to start a business um, because sometimes it's sort of, it's sort of hard to find a mentor for something that you haven't done something. Maybe you want to do something new that hasn't been done. Right. So let's just make it simple and say you're starting a business. We live in the greatest time in human history to be alive, okay? You are one online course, one webinar, one whatever. We might not have, we might not have meetups these days, but you are, so, whatever you want. I don't care if you want to start a vending machine business, if you want to start a house cleaning business, if you want to start what, like you are literally one course away. So what I did When I was stepping away from my job and started my own business, I invested in courses. I bought courses, people who have been doing it for 15 years. And what you're doing is you're literally buying their mistakes. They're telling you what they did wrong. So some, I took a course, a guy who's been in the business for 15 years. It wasn't rocket science. You literally take what they give you and you just apply it. But I also saw something earlier this week that said only 7% of people who purchase an online course finish it. Mm which is kind of mm. crazy, but I would like to think that the people on here, the athletes, the go getters, they're going to be in that 7%, right? So literally, like I said, in, in today's age, it might be, you know, going on YouTube, going to the library, purchasing an online course. Like there's somebody who is willing to teach you what you want to know, but you're just going to have to come out of your pocket because those who pay, pay attention. So don't think that you're going to Google and YouTube your way to success. No, you're going to have to not get those J's that are coming out for Christmas, right? You <laughs> like make that sacrifice, invest in your business and you will make 10 times what you would have made, you know, just by going and spending, wasting the money, right? So you're going to have to come out of your pocket and invest in yourself, invest in your business, invest in your future. Mm, bars. Those who pay, pay attention. Well said. Come on. Well now. said. You got to have some skin in the game. You got to be investing in yourself. That's huge. That's a major thing that I've always done that. I was never afraid to put money into bettering my situation. You know, it takes money to make money. So at the end of the day, and here here you are again, bringing up another great point, um, because I'm sure you've seen this too. I feel like a lot of athletes are prideful, and I'm speaking from experience, prideful in the sense that we don't necessarily not only want to admit that we're going through something, but ask for help, which is Mm -hmm. ironic because we've been coached our whole lives. Mm -hmm. Yet when we get out, we think we're supposed to have it all figured out and we don't look for that coaching, right? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you feel like maybe in your own experience or through some of the athletes you've encountered or worked with, do you feel like there's anything else that kind of holds athletes back from really stepping into their greatness and, and not just settling, but really stepping into something greater and tapping into their, their true vision or even creating a vision for their, themselves? Oh, wait, that's heavy. Um, and I think I probably could only answer that. I probably couldn't have answered that like maybe even six months ago. 
I think mm. that the, and I could be wrong, this is my personal opinion. I think that we see ourselves one way for so long, right? Whether you wanna go to the NFL, for me, the WNBA, whatever. And when that doesn't happen, you are heartbroken. Like you have to think about it. You have a 15, 20 year relationship coming to an end. And for a lot of athletes, it doesn't even click that there are so many areas to explore. I don't care if you get into, you want to become a, a vegan chef, you want to go into interior decorating, you want to go into um, designing robots. Like, lit like there are literally countless things to explore, right? But we never ever see ourselves as, oh, I could be an expert in this or I could learn that because we've just focused on the sport for so long. We fail to realize that there are five million other areas to explore. There's no telling what else you could be good at. And I always say, I think that your sport is your training ground for life. If you played at the college college level, I could be biased, but I feel as if you have a unique calling and your calling required special training. And that's why you had to, <laughs> you had to go through that preseason, right? You had to go through that injury. You had to go through that adversity because what you're called to do next, it, it, it doesn't, the average person can't do it. And if there's non athletes here, I'm sorry, but I'm like I said, I'm a little biased. But I think that we just have to open our minds. Maybe you're a great artist and you like, I don't know what it is, but there's so the world is so much bigger than your sport. And we hinder ourselves because we think, okay, if I didn't make it pro, I'm going to be the next uh, great coach. Like, that's cool. That's wonderful. Coaching is sacred. I, I have a lot of respect for coaches. But if you would just stop to understand and realize there's so much more that you could do and just start to explore, just start to tap into the things you couldn't look into because you had weights and film and I, start to explore some of those things now. Mm, preach, Joy. See, <laughs> this is why this is why she's on here, folks. This is why Joy is on here. Open it up. Athlete for door. <laughs> Right. You and I have had so many conversations about mm -hmm. this, too, because I think if we can shift or athletes can shift their perspective, like you mm -hmm. said, the breakup. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the breakup is real. So I'm not it saying, hurts. oh, yeah. you need to hurt. It hurts so bad. It hurts so bad, especially when you're on the couch or, you know, waking up in your childhood bedroom. That's, you know, it makes it even worse. It's like mm -hmm. salt in the wound. But if we can get through the healing process intentionally. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's mm -hmm. easy to stay stuck there. I know me. I was throwing a pity party, you know, drinking all the time and under the covers watching Netflix, you know, like I'm in a rom-com or something, you know, but <laughs> eating ice cream. But if we can intentionally get out of that mm -hmm. and heal ourselves and not, and like you said, make that shift to be excited for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think that's where, that's where it is, is making that shift to say, okay, you know, it's not like, oh, I can't play ball anymore. You can reach a point where you're like, man, I'm excited for like the world is your oyster. Come you on. Know? And you're going in there with a different skill set. That's something to be excited about. Like yeah. Joyce said, like we got five millions of opportunities. Mm -hmm. with, I'm not lying. Some people, you know, they may be down and out. I, I don't want to be insensitive about what's going on in the world, but we really are in the best time to be alive. If you think about it. We have opportunities that our parents didn't have, you know, so we don't have to work a job for 40, 50 years mm -hmm. and, and get the watch at the retirement party like they did. Like we can do <laughs> so much more. And I know that you have so much, not just a podcast, you know, sets for life, not just the book, uh, the sweet spot, but you have actual content and courses. And I know you're just getting started. You went on mm -hmm. a little, okay, let's just, let's just put it like this. <laughs> All right. So I listened to Joy's podcast. I've been listening for the past couple of years and Joy announced recently on sets for life that she's taking a hiatus. So I don't know if you can get into, you know, what people can expect when you come back, but I know you're in the lab and it's going to be yeah. trouble when you come back. Yeah. Lab. Yeah. So I know you're going to be on these athletes heads. So it's go ahead just, and tell me it's about just it. so crazy how when you're when you're in go mode 24 seven and you hit the pause, but then you sit back and you just get out a sheet of paper and you start to write stuff. I have I've been tempted to be like, forget the sabbatical. Like I'm back. Like I got something I want to <laughs> share. But I think I, I literally this last year, Taj, I can't lie to you. I'm, I'll be 32 in a couple of weeks. And I spent my time from grad school up until December of last year working a job, doing what I was conditioned to do. And I, I have built some amazing relationships with some amazing people. I work with some great people. I work with some incredible student athletes. But there was just still something I was like, there has to be more to life. Um, I want to be more fulfilled. I want to make more money. I want to have more freedom. 
And over this past year, I've and I've been talking to my friends, my family, people who are close, people who know what's going on, because I haven't really shared a whole lot. But they're kind of like, Joy, you quit your job a year ago and you're still alive. Like it's it's like people will make <laughs> you think if you quit your job, you're gonna die. Like, and you're gonna be out on the streets. N no, like it, it's not the case. So now I literally I had to hit the pause button on the podcast because for so long I was telling athletes how to take their skills and go dominate in the workplace, how to take their skills. So I had to rethink my own message. So that's what this sabbatical is really about. And I'm not saying that I'm going to be like, oh, athletes have to become entrepreneurs, but I want to start to shed light on some other options. Life is not one size fits all. That whole go to school, work hard, get a good job. That was like some baby boomer advice. We need some new 2020, like what we're, we're living in a gig economy, right? It's not what it, nobody is working a job for 40 years anymore. So why are we still using that same advice? Like, why can't we show athletes what it's like to build a business? Like, I think the biggest thing that comes, the biggest issue with entrepreneurs is that they quit, right? Mm. It's not about, like I said earlier, it's not about being smart, being talented, having the best idea. It is about perseverance. And athletes have that. Like, how many times do we get knocked down and get back up? How many injuries do we battle? How many times do we have to get over coach saying something that might have been a low blow? Like, we just come back again and again. And like, it's like, it's like, it, it's ridiculous. And we have this skill set. So all I've been working on, like I was saying earlier, is the six figure athlete. Like that six figure job is not the goal anymore. Six figures is the floor. That's, let's start there and let's build because you have the skills, you have the knowledge, you have the perseverance to go into entrepreneurship and dominate. So what I'm working on is really just refining my message, refining my, my thinking, because I've had to undo some things that I learned that I understood. And now I want to show student athletes, former athletes, whoever, you've got more than one option. So let's explore. Mm. Yeah. And I want to applaud you for that because I think that takes something. I think that takes a lot of courage for you to be at a point where you're like, I want to tailor my message more to the people who are like me, right? And encourage them to mm -hmm. think bigger. I mm -hmm. think that, that that takes a lot. And um, I'm really, you know, I can sit on here and acknowledge you all day, but I just want to <laughs> say thank you for being one of the pioneers in this space. Thank you for being a, a sister to me and an ally you know, throughout all these years. And it's just amazing to watch the growth and the impact that you're having. <laughs> and the crazy part is we're just getting warmed up. You know, Ooh. you haven't even left the locker room yet. You might just be mm. getting taken up. You, know mm. Yikes. you haven't even so take your warm ups off yet. Good grief. I'm going to get the tearaways, the old school. I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I couldn't even see. Your shirt says, let's see the shirt. Oh, yeah. Yo, let me see the shirt. Hold up. Boom. <laughs> More than a just in case, Stop just it. I'll figure you on my way out. You know, I'll let you, you know. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. Yeah. I didn't even see that till now. Okay, yeah. I see you. Okay, more than a baller. I know that's, okay, that's a a preview for what's to come. Hello. Enjoy water, folks. Hello. Tap in. I'm in the Speaking lab, which, You've been in the lab. You've been in the lab since I know you. <laughs> you got your goggles and your white coat on. You've been in the lab. <laughs> Talk to me. Okay, where can people get in touch with you? Because that's, that's what everybody's wondering right now. I want to know. You know, obviously go get the book, the sweet spot, but talk about the podcast, Sets for Life, and then whatever you have cooking, which is going to be major. Talk to me about where people can go tap into all that. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it. You can find me on social media. I'm most active on Twitter and Instagram at Six Figure Athlete, and that's just the number six figure athlete. Uh, you can go check out my website, joywalker.com. That's J-O-I walker.com. Uh, those are the best places. Shoot me a DM. I'm having a webinar tomorrow that's going to tell you more about building a business that is called From Athlete to Entrepreneur. It's tomorrow at six o'clock Eastern. Check the links in my bio. Register. You don't I just like it's supposed to be an hour. It might be two. I don't know. Cause I get excited with stuff like this. So <laughs> it's free. So just sign up, catch me there tomorrow. Like I said, hit me up on social media, check out the website, reach out, check out the book. I would just love the courses. I got, I would just love to connect with you guys. Mm. Well, Joy, thank you so much. Everybody, please go check out Joy. Thank you again for coming on and sharing. I know there's going to be tremendous value derived from everything you shared with us. I got value out of it. And I already know you. I've been listening to you. So I appreciate you coming on. And um, we will definitely be in touch for some more things. I'm looking. Everybody stay tuned. Don't. Hey, you might want to keep your eye on Joy because she's when she drops, it's going to be big. <laughs> thank you All so right, much Joy. for having me, Taj. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. 
All right, next up, folks. First of all, how about that Joy Walker? All right. Next up, we have Katie Spada, right? Katie is, and she has a presentation for you. She's going to go through some information. The thing I love about Katie, which we'll probably talk about, is, you know, I'll be feeling guilty. A lot of us athletes, you know, we think we got to stay on our, on our diet that we were on when we were playing. And, um, you know, I'll be, it'll be a Sunday morning. I'll be eating a cinnamon roll or something, beat myself up. Like, oh, man, I shouldn't be having this. I'm going to get fat. I'm going to lose my six-pack. And then I go on Katie's page, and she goes, you know, dear athletes, it's okay to eat whatever you want from time to time. You don't have to work out 24-7, you know. We'll get into that in a little bit. I want to let Katie get into her presentation, but it's a brief introduction. Katie Spada is a former competitive synchronized swimmer at the Ohio State University. Had to come correct. Katie is a registered dietitian nutritionist and the founder of Spada Strong Nutrition, where she helps athletes learn to fuel themselves. Side note, I love that her handles across social media are is fueling former athletes. I think that's amazing. Anyway, Katie helps former athletes or athletes learn to fuel themselves for life after sport and improve their body image. Please welcome to Athletepreneur, Ms. Katie Spada. Hey, Taj, thank you so much for having me. And can I just say before we get in, get started with this, wow, I was watching Joy and she is absolutely incredible. I'm, I'm inspired after watching that. That was fantastic. <laughs> Me too. It's great to have you here, Katie. I know you're already going to drop some gems. Um, I know you have some information to share with us. I love all yes. the information. Like I say, you keep me guilt free. You keep me eating uh, whatever Good. I want to without being, you know, to uh, without beating myself up too much. But I'm going to go ahead and let you get into it. I'm going to shut all up right. and I'm going to tune in. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully, this will go ahead and. You guys let me know if and when you can see that. Let's see, let's see. Um, <laughs> we did test this, so hopefully we can go ahead and get this back to, to work in. Okay, there we go. Did we get it to work now? All right. All right, now we are rocking and rolling. So welcome everyone. Like Taj said, my name is Katie Spada. Thank you for bearing with me on the little technical difficulties there. Um, I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and former competitive synchronized swimmer for The Ohio State University. And today I'm gonna talk about transitioning your nutrition in life after sport. So quick little about me. Like I said, I was an artistic or synchronized swimmer for 11 years. I competed at the U.S. national team level for three appointments at The Ohio State University, um, and I'm the founder and CEO of Spot a Strong Nutrition. So we're going to talk about athlete identity and body image, and you might be thinking, what does this have to do with entrepreneurship? Well, just like in sports, the way we fuel our body really determines how we perform, and the same is true when we retire. The same is true when we are working to get our businesses started, and we're going to get into that. So the connection, your body allows you to compete and achieve. It is the ability, it gives you the ability to perform, and we oftentimes have this connection with the way our body looks and our athlete identity identity. Um, Taj and Joy were talking about that a little bit, the breakup. And the breakup can be even more exacerbated when we start to notice body changes and we start to see things happening that maybe we weren't, we weren't used to when we were competing. So a 2019 study done in the journal Nutrients actually talked all about this. So this is very evidence-based. Individuals who continue to identify as athletes had a poorer relationship with food and body when they retired. All right, so here's a quick breakdown of the stats. We love stats, right? We're athletes, we always love stats. Ah, beautiful, there we go. 42 to 65% of retired athletes engage in adverse nutrition behaviors compared to 26% of current athletes. What do I mean by that? I mean binging, restricting, purging. The percent of athletes engaging in these behaviors increases significantly, more than doubles, when we retire. In this study, 75% of retired gymnasts and swimmers were classified as healthy, according to BMI. And I could do a whole other pr presentation on how BMI is not accurate for the athlete. But for, for the case here, we're going to just go ahead and chat about it. Yet 55% were dissatisfied with their current body. Now, as athletes, we want to always be better. We want to keep pushing, keep improving. And that is such a gift for us. And that is what helps us be such great entrepreneurs. At the same time, it can also hinder us. We want our nutrition to help us, not hinder us. 
in life after sport. And 60% were engaging in weight loss practices, even though they did not need to engage in weight loss practices. So why it matters, like I said, how you feel about yourself determines how you fuel yourself. So as athletes, we are really great at understanding how our bodies work, and we're even better at ignoring them. That injury that's been plaguing you all season and you know you should have gotten it checked, but now it's to the point where, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can make it to the end of the year. We are aware of these things. We know how our bodies feel, and yet we oftentimes just ignore the signs that they're giving us. So in life after sport, it is time to really tune back in. We want our bodies and our nutrition to serve us. That is the goal. Serve us well. Okay, so quick breakdown of hunger and fullness. Um, the reason I touch on hunger and fullness is because as athletes, depending on what sport you were in, you either ignored hunger so you could eat more to bulk up, or you ignored um, you ignored fullness. Actually, let me reverse that. You either ignored hunger to avoid eating as much because you were in aesthetic sport and you were trying to look good, or you ignored fullness in order to eat past your fullness so you could gain muscle um, and, and get bulky. So there's always two athletes I see when they come out of sport. The aesthetic athlete who was trying to maintain thinness the entire time they were competing, and now that's exacerbated when they retire, or the strength athlete, the bulk athlete who was trying to constantly put on weight, put on muscle, and they were always overeating, always eating past fullness so that they could really gain more muscle. So we ignore our hunger and fullness cues. Signs of hunger include thinking about food. Have you ever found yourself being like, I'm thinking about food 24 seven. How are we supposed to put all of our energy into building our businesses if we're constantly thinking about food and anticipating the next meal? If you're thinking about food all day, chances are you're not fueling your body well. Signs of fullness, I'm gonna just point out the ones that are kind of not as commonly thought about. Food tastes less good. The flavors are less strong. Think about your favorite restaurant. You go to your favorite restaurant and you take that first bite and it is the most amazing food you have ever tasted. Then as you go through the meal, maybe the flavors become less strong. They become less intense. Those are signs that your body is starting to get full. It's had enough energy and maybe it's time to think about starting to pause. In my work with former athletes, I use the hunger fullness scale very often because it's a tangible way to assess how we're feeling when we're eating, when we're looking at eating, when we're reaching fullness. And this is the quick breakdown of that hunger fullness scale. The one is you are famished, irritable, faint, starving. You are like, I need food. I don't care what it is now. The 10 is that Thanksgiving status overstuffed. We're about, about a month out from Thanksgiving. I'm sure everyone has felt that in their life where you're like, I don't even know if I can move off of this table. We really want to hang out in a sweet spot. Between three and seven is what I usually recommend so that you are able and ready to fuel your body well. When we get too hungry, it impacts our ability to make food choices that are going to fuel us best. And so that's why I say, you know, if you reach... You come home, you haven't eaten all day, and now all of a sudden the entire cereal box is gone. It's not that you have a lack of control. We're athletes. We have so much control. We have self-control out, out the window. What happens is physiology takes over. Your body needs food fast. It needs energy fast. It's smart. That's why you grab things like cookies and chips and cereal, because it knows it can get energy quickly from it. So we don't want to allow ourselves to get to that place. That's when we make food decisions that don't serve us as well. The same thing when we get too full, then we reach that kind of like post meal, needing to take a, take a nap, getting really tired, overly stuffed. It impacts our abilities to be productive throughout the rest of the day. And I want to talk about the burn to earn mentality. Taj kind of mentioned that, oh, if I'm not working out 24 seven, if I'm not doing, you know, hitting, hitting the grind all the time. We have this burn to earn mentality that continues with us when we retire. Um, in this same study I talked about, retired swimmers reported that when they skipped workouts, they felt the desire to skip meals to compensate. And I'm going to talk on the next slide why, we, why that is not beneficial. Um, but because when we're competing, 
we're constantly working out, it almost becomes this association. Well, I practiced, I earned my post-workout refuel. I can go ahead and eat. Well, I worked out today. It's okay. I can have the cookie. And we build this relationship in our mind with working out and food. And if we don't work out, we're not allowed to eat. And that is just not the case. You still need to eat even if you didn't work out. This is kind of the concern I have with a lot of former athletes. They say, well, if I'm not working out, I'm going to overeat. I'm not going to be able to monitor myself. I'll just be out of control. When you're tuned into your body, your hunger cues will adjust. Your muscles aren't the only thing that use energy. And this really comes back to being an entrepreneur as a former athlete. Your brain what allows us to think up all these incredible ideas and put out content into the world and build businesses accounts for a minimum of 20% of your oxygen use and therefore your calorie, calorie usage as well. If you're thinking, you should be eating. If you are sitting down at your computer brainstorming or Joy when she was writing her book or Taja, he's building all these incredible businesses, you're thinking. You may not be physically moving your body, but your body needs energy. And this is one of the things that I try and emphasize the most because in the sports world, we just associate burning calories through working out and being allowed to eat. Whereas when we retire, the way we're burning calories, our body adjusts. We burn way more with our brains than maybe we do with our muscles when we're, when we're retired, but we are using our brain in a different way. Um, so making sure you're fueling yourself so that you can put out all those incredible ideas into the world. We cannot be successful entrepreneurs on an empty stomach. We cannot. And so we need to make sure we're fueling ourselves well. So getting into a quick practical breakdown of it, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, um, but quick review. We've got carbs, proteins, and fats. Those are your macronutrients. You probably hear macros pretty often. Carbs are your body's most ideal source of energy, specifically for your brain and your red blood cells. And your red blood cells car carry oxygen. They transport oxygen to every other part of your body. So we want our red blood cells to be fueled. Our brain, like I said, is the ability to think, the ability to take ideas and put it into action. And sure, you can fuel your body on just protein and fat. But the thing is, carbs are the most ideal source of energy. They are the most easily usable source of energy. And we want to function we want to function well. We want to function like a well-oiled machine. Just like when we're competing, when you're putting plans into play, depending on what sport you were in, as a synchronized swimmer, all of our patterns were down to the inch where we were supposed to be. When you're putting a play into, when you are practicing a play, it has to be very well-oiled and we want our body to be the same. Carbs are that transporter for us. They allow our bodies to function optimally. Protein is the building blocks for your muscles, your skin, your nails, your hair. It is important also for fluid balance and enzyme production. So anytime your body is sending signals via enzymes, we need protein. Fat is essential for vitamin absorption, vitamins A, D, E, and K. Um, vitamin D has been pretty, pretty popular to talk about right now with immune support. Same with vitamin A. The only way you're going to get benefit from these vitamins is if you're having fat so they can be absorbed. It's also important for cell signaling and hormone optimization and can help with satiety. Now, we want our brain to be signaling. We want our cells to be signaling as best as possible. We need fat for that to occur um, without being hindered. So a little quick put it into play for you guys. Optimize your meals. You can start doing this right now so you can show up your absolute best every day for yourself in life after sport. Include all three macros at your meals, carbs, fats, and proteins. Fiber, think about fiber that's usually in your carb, like your complex carbs, fruits and veggies, whole grains, different things like that will have adequate fiber in them. Think about the satisfaction factor. We are gonna touch on this on the next slide. You wanna include those fun foods. Like Taj was saying, I am here for the no guilt mentality. You should never feel guilty for eating. And the reason we often end up overeating or feeling like we need to have four cinnamon buns on a Saturday morning is because we're not routinely including fun foods into our meals. All foods fit. That is the mentality I work with all my clients on and practice in my day-to-day -day life. And fullness does not equal satisfaction. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. So fullness is the physical feeling of satiety. 
it is the right portion size, for example. So sure, you can have a meal that is just chicken, rice, and broccoli. Do you find yourself an hour later staring at the pantry with the door open thinking, oh, I just really want some Oreos, and then before you know it, the entire bag of Oreos is gone? That is because we're not including satisfaction. We might be physically full. We may be even thinking, I'm not hungry. Why, Why do I feel like I need something else? Because you're not satisfied. Satisfaction is the emotional feeling of satiety, meaning you ate the right things. Maybe instead of just having a plain chicken breast, you include some barbecue sauce, or you do like spicy chili broccoli or cilantro lime rice. You amp up the flavors. You add in things like butter and oils, and maybe you even include dessert as part of your meal. This is important to help avoid the constant thinking about food. When we do not address satisfaction and we only focus on fullness, that's when we find ourselves spending way too much time staring at our fridge, staring at our pantry, trying to find something, but fearful of overeating. And is this too many calories? What's happening here? We want to include all foods. We want to be both full and satisfied when we walk away from a meal. So wrapping up here, there is a huge difference between your training life and life after sport when it comes to fueling your body. When we were training, your sport was your job. Food was needed to support training and body aesthetics. Time was focused on dedicating your training and your fueling. And there were sport culture influences. For example, if you were in a weight class-based sport, there was a lot of pressure to make weight. You had to adjust your fueling for that. In my sport, you had to look a certain way when you stepped out on deck. That really impacted my food choices. In life after sport, our priorities are so different. We're career focused. Maybe we are building a business. If you're here, I'm, I'm guessing you're probably focused on building a business or getting started. Maybe you're family focused, relationships, social lives, all of those things that we did not have time to put the energy into. Now we do and our food and our fueling can support that. We also have society cultural influences as well. And that is something that is a big switch. Maybe you had the, this ideal body when you were an athlete and now you retired. And specifically for, for my female athletes out there, maybe you had you were really strong and you were very muscular. And once you retire in society, maybe that's not seen as um, you know feminine or pretty. Or for my guy athletes out there, maybe you were nice and bulky when you were competing and then you retire and you start to lose a little bit of muscle. All of these things impact our relationship with our body and our relationship with food and how we choose to fuel ourselves. So if you don't feel good about the way you look, that will impact your ability to fuel yourself well. And I could go a whole presentation on body image in life after sport, um, but I wanted to just touch on that here because you want to be able to look in the mirror and be like, yeah, I look amazing and know that you are choosing foods to support your health and your ability to perform instead of choosing foods to determine how your body looks. Um, because I wasted way too much time trying to manipulate the way my body looked and it hindered my ability to start my business, to grow in my career as a dietitian. Um, and I don't want that for you. Our nutrition and our feeling should support all of these goals, not hinder them. So this is kind of the quick breakdown from that same study. We're, we retire as athletes, our body composition changes, we go one of two ways. We either have a decreased body acceptance, which in turn results in maladaptive behaviors such as compensatory exercise, restrictive eating, binge eating, and the cycle continues. Or what I hope for every former athlete is our body acceptance increases as we retire and we have adaptive behaviors that support the life we are trying to build. One of my favorite sayings is your body does not determine your greatness. Even if it did when we were competing, it is not the case anymore. It is the vessel that carries it. Fuel it well, move it daily, respect it, and thrive in life after sport. These are my resources. If anyone is interested, this is all evidence-based. Um, as a practitioner, as a dietitian, I'm very um, ethically bound to only talk about evidence-based nutrition. Um, and so here are some other resources. And I want to just thank you guys so much. I will go ahead and stop, stop screen share. Oh, perfect. There we go.
All right, I'm back. Katie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I okay. can. That was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Um, I think one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I wanted to have you on, and we're going to dive into your entrepreneurial process and everything yes. you're doing with your business in just a second. But I think it's important, not just for current and former athletes or athletes who are building businesses. I think everything you just shared is so important because like you said, your body is your vehicle that we mm -hmm. go through life with. And, you know, just speaking from personal experience, which is, I'm really glad that we came across each other. I had a really hard time when I was done playing um, because I was so, it was weird. I was, I was kind of binge eating, but I was caught in a weird cycle of eating a lot, you know, even more so than I did when I was playing, but I refused to let myself get out of shape. So I was overeating and overtraining, which as you would imagine, like yeah. led to some, uh, some pretty, especially my, you know, when I was kind of working a corporate job, my, my performance was suffering. So thankfully, mm -hmm. by the time I kind of got into entrepreneurship, I had it under control. But one of the, the things that I really love that you said is, um, you know, how you feel about yourself determines how you feel yourself. Right. Yeah. Um, and I love that you have that, that whole connection about the body and the mind being connected as one and not allowing yourself to feel guilty. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think I heard you mention this during your uh, presentation, but one of the things that I picked up from you, which I didn't even have a, a word for it before, was intuitive eating. I believe yes. I heard you say that. Can you just dive into, for those listening, can you dive into what intuitive eating means to you? Yeah, of course. So intuitive eating is actually an evidence-based practice to the way you fuel yourself, the way you make nutrition and food choices. So it's based on 10 principles. It was created by two registered dietitians, and it really takes the pressure off of the appearance focus and puts it more on health focused. Why are you making these food choices? How are they going to impact you emotionally, physically, and mentally? And it brings all three of those into it. So often we just think about food from a physical standpoint. Well, this apple is going to make me feel better than, you know, it's going to make me look better than this cupcake. But if you're thinking about the cupcake for the rest of the day, and then you eat, end up eating 14 cupcakes because you were just thinking about it the whole day, that's not healthy. Just eating the cupcake is healthy. So it takes the guilt out of food. It puts the focus on health and how you feel. Um, and that's what I loved about it because coming from an aesthetic sport, there was so much guilt anytime we would eat something that wasn't considered quote unquote healthy. Um, and I, I carried that with me into life after sport and it really impacted my ability to be present in my internship when I was studying for my RD exam, my first job. And I, I realized how much energy and brain space I was wasting on trying to maintain this perfect body, quote unquote, and eat the same way as I did as an athlete when that was no longer serving me. And it's okay that that did not serve me anymore. I think that's one of the biggest things is we can transition our nutrition as we transition into life after sport as well. Mm, I love it. And the thing that blew my mind about even just the phrase intuitive eating because I, I felt like I had gotten to a place, you know, once I stopped overeating and overtraining, I got to a place where, like you talk about, I was actually listening to my body. Yes. You know? And that, that's the key. So when I heard you say that, I was listening to a podcast you were on. I think it was with uh, Bridget Case. And I heard you yeah. talk about uh, After Orange Slices. Shout out Bridget Case. Yes. And I heard you drop that phrase, intuitive eating. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I never heard that before. I think that's what I'm doing. And like yes. you talk about, it allows you to be guilt free. It allows you to keep yourself in a place where you're fueled to do the things that you need to do. And you don't have to worry about having a bunch of apps and counting calories and all that stuff. You just kind of listen, tap in and know that, OK, it's OK to eat this. I'm not going to feel guilty or I need this to feel fueled. And mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, one of the many things that's beautiful about the work that you're doing. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So. And I want to, sorry, go ahead, Katie, please. No, I was just going to say, I think athletes are so uniquely set up to be incredible intuitive eaters as well. Like it should just seamlessly fit into our lives because we know this body so well, we just need to take a moment to stop and listen to what it's telling us. Um, and it's really, an, it's an easy transition for a lot of athletes. Um, so if it scares you, it's, it's a lot easier to transition into that than you might think. Right. Well said. I love it. Um, aside from obviously all the great work that you do and me being a fan of all the work you put out, so I don't have to feel guilty about what I'm eating, uh, guilt free eating folks, there's no, yes. there's no substitute for it. Aside from that, you know, you are a registered dietitian nutritionist. Mm -hmm. Um, but the thing that sets you apart is you actually formed a business by the mm -hmm. strong nutrition. Um, yes. can you talk about, you know, you already have the degrees, highly educated, talk about 
what is it that made you want to branch off and say, you know what, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I think I can have a bigger impact this way. What was that process like for you? Yeah, great question. So I actually, when I first retired, I had no aspirations to own a business. At least I didn't, I didn't think I did. They were always there. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I had the plan, like, like you and Joy were talking about, I'm going to get my hospital job. I'm going to stay there for 30 years. I'm going to retire at 55 and that's going to be my life. Um, but then I started to realize how dietitians didn't necessarily have the same respect as I was hoping they would in the hospital setting. Um, and so I created an Instagram to share about what dietitians do. And to my surprise, I had so many former teammates reach out to me being like, hey, I'm really struggling with this. And I was like, wow, okay, I struggled with that. And I had worked through that myself. I can help them. Um, and my Instagram started to grow and I had more and more people reaching out. And I was like, there's a need here to help athletes so that their nutrition is not hindering them in life after sport. Um, so I created an LLC and kind of dove right in. It was a hot mess at first because I did not know what I was doing. Um, but I, I still say that was kind of the best thing because it allowed me to figure out what my message was, who I wanted to talk to. And I always knew it was former athletes, um, but really getting clear on that. And then I did eventually, I ended up hiring a business coach and you and Joy were talking about investing in yourself. And that is the best thing I ever did. Um, I think we're so quick to bet on ourselves in our sports. And yet when we step into life after sport, it's this new realm and we're almost hesitant to bet on ourselves. Um, but I would just say, just do it because investing in this business coach, investing in myself, which is essentially what it was, helped my business to grow beyond expectations. Even over the past, I invested last December. So it's almost been a year in this past 10, 11 months, my business has gone in places I would have never dreamed of. Um, and so quickly. And so it's worth it to bet on yourself. You can do it. I think that's also the hesitation. What if, what if I fail? What if I can't do it? Um, you can do it. You may still stumble, but that's okay. We stumbled in sports and we still got back up. Um, and I think that is, that was something I was worried about. I had to be a perfectionist in everything. And that's not the case in entrepreneurship. Um, messy action, take messy action and go for it. I love that. That's such an important message that you're sharing. Um, I think that's huge for, for people to learn from your experience and, and hear, once again, you know, we talked about it with Joy too, investing in yourself, betting on yourself. There's yeah. a common thread. I'm sure we'll hear that with Amobi and Marcus, right? Just yeah. investing in yourself and betting on yourself and believing, like you said, that you can do it is key. And not being a perfectionist. I hear so many people where, even, even myself a lot of times, you know, not, not so much lately because I got some good guidance. Um, but at the beginning, wanting everything to be perfect and allowing that to be my excuse for not taking action. And yeah. I love the fact that you talked about when you first started it, it was a hot mess, but you continued to press forward. Right. And the thing about it, you know, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I already know this is the case. It wasn't like you were pressing forward just for yourself. You're pressing forward because you are realizing all the people you're impacting. So mm -hmm. when your vision or your goal is bigger than yourself and you know, if I quit doing this, people are literally going to not be able to you know they're going to be suffering because i gave up on it or i didn't stay consistent so your message is, is uh it's super super important and I, I really appreciate you sharing that thank you absolutely i think that's one of the biggest things that we gain from sport too is that it's it's about more than just you there's a greater purpose that we're working towards and that same thing you know all of us have unique experiences and talents that allow us to help people in one way or another and my tumultuous experience with nutrition and body image competing really allows me to step into this place where I can say, yes, I know exactly where you've been. And with my nutrition background as a dietitian, help them. And I don't want former athletes to suffer like I did. You don't have to spend five, six years fighting against food in your body. There is another way. And that's what keeps driving me is knowing like, I don't want a former athlete to sit on their kitchen floor with a jar of peanut butter, you know, bawling their eyes out because they feel like they can't real story. That was totally me at one point. <laughs> right. um, you know, like I, there is so much more to life after sport. And I think we allow our fear of our bodies changing and our nutrition needing to be perfect and no longer looking like an athlete hinder our ability to really, you know, in your words, thrive in life after sport. That is the goal. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's another reason aside from allowing people to live guilt free. Another reason why I feel like your work is so important is because I've personally worked and coached a lot of former athletes through the transition. Um, and I find that for the, especially for, for the women, right. Um, they kind yeah. of feel like you said, I'm either I'm too muscular or they put on too much weight. Right. Yep. Uh, 
And I think that that the work that you're doing is so much deeper than nutrition, so much deeper than being fueled. Um, a lot of your work is definitely having an impact on an emotional level. You yes. know, there's female clients who I've worked with and maybe they're, you know, I'm not working out as consistently or, you know, I'm, I don't like, you know, I put on a whole bunch of weight and I'll just be like, Hey, you need to get in touch with Katie or go check out her content. And I'm sure a lot of those people's lives, of course, I mean, I've benefited from it. So I got it. I got to pass it on to someone else, but I'm sure a lot of those people who I've sent your way or just invited to check out your content have benefited from it tremendously. So, yeah. um, and with that being said, where can people get in touch? How can people, I know you have a ton of resources, not just your Instagram, but I mean, just talk about how people can learn more about what you're doing. Yeah. So, um, I am most active on Instagram at fueling.former.athletes, but you can also find me on my website, spotastrongnutrition.com. Um, you can send me an email spotted.strong.nutrition at gmail.com. Um, I'm fortunate enough right now that I can still respond to every DM and I love connecting with former athletes. So send me a message. Um, I've got one-to-one -one and group coaching and hopefully some, some bigger things in the future. Once I finish my master's. That is, that is first on the, <laughs> first on the docket. But yeah, I love just connecting. Even if it's just to say, Hey, um, send me a message and, and we can connect. Awesome. Well, before we get out of here, I just want to touch on one more thing that you just said. Notice yes. how Katie said before, you know, once she finishes her master's, but she didn't wait. Katie didn't wait to say, Oh, I'll get my master's and then I'll take action. Katie's been doing this. Katie's been building that the master's is just another notch under her belt. But at yep. the end of the day, She's, she's not hesitant. She's not being a perfectionist. She's taking action and going for it and having a major impact on people. So, yeah, I, I did have people tell me, you should wait till you're done with your master's to start a business. If you have that fire in you, if it's something telling you, like, I need to start this now, go with it, do it, bet on yourself. Um, I'm so glad I didn't wait. I'm so glad I didn't wait. Bars. Well, get in touch with Katie, everybody. Thank you so much for sharing that last piece, too. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Dive in, folks, just like Katie did. Thank yeah. you for being on the Athlepreneur panel. I know that uh, there's many more of these to come and you are always invited. So thank, thank you again you, for sharing and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thanks so much for having me. Good luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you. All right, everybody. Some fire. You heard Katie. Don't feel guilty about eating that cinnamon roll like I did. All right. And next up, we got my guy, Amobi Okugo. All right. Professional soccer player. Still a professional soccer player. Not a former athlete, but still playing and building a business. He's the founder of A Frugal Athlete. A Frugal Athlete provides an insider's look into the personal, financial, and career playbooks of professional athletes while educating and maximizing their financial resources. A Frugal Athlete's mission is to help athletes make, manage, and multiply money through financial education and athlete empowerment. Please welcome to Athletepreneur, Mr. Amobi Okugo. Hey, how you doing, Taj? There he is. What's up, my guy with the creator shirt on? I see. <laughs> <laughs> How's everything going? Thanks for having everything's me. He's great, man. Uh, hey, it's a pleasure to have you here, man. You know, I have tremendous respect for what you're doing. Uh, you know, you and I are both major Nipsey Hustle fans. You know what I mean? So <laughs> from the first conversation, man, I could tell that, uh, I mean, you are obviously on a, on a powerful mission and, um, and obviously going places. And one of the things that impressed me the most about you is that you're still obviously things have been impacted because of COVID, but mm -hmm. I just want to dive right in and, and talk about what is it that had you, you know, we talk about not, not waiting or not hesitating. What is it that had you jump in and start a frugal athlete as a current athlete? You didn't even wait till your career was over. Can you talk about that? No, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. And to reiterate what Katie said, that, that was a great uh, panel that she had on, like, you can't wait. Because when you're a current athlete, that's when you have your most leverage. So, mm. you know, like my dad, my mentors always told me, you got to strike while the iron is hot. You know, so when you have the leverage of being a current professional athlete or a current student athlete, uh, when you have the most leverage, you know, you don't go into the meeting um, and ask for a raise when you, you know, you just got in the door or you haven't done anything. You know, you want to make sure uh, you have that you have that leverage. So as a professional athlete, um, that's kind of why I started, you know, I didn't want to have to go um, knock on doors, you know, after I'm done playing um, and doing all that. So um, that was more about just trying to be efficient with my, my career and be, um, be uh, able to be economical and um, leverage what I had going at the time. I love that, man. I love that. You know, obviously a lot of my work is centered around athletes who are already kind of retired out in the real world. 
Um, but I think your example and everything you just shared of, of diving right in, for those very reasons, strike while the iron is hot, why would you wait, um, is, is super impressive, man. Like, how did you, because I think a lot of people, they would use the excuse of time, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't have time, you know, I'm, I'm still playing. Um, how, how did you kind of eliminate that excuse? I know you talked about the reason why, but how did you actually do it from a process standpoint? Like, how did you make time to build a frugal athlete? No, so uh, fortunate, uh, fortunately, um, I, I don't have like a family or kids or anything like that. So, you know, uh, a friend of mine always jokes. He's like, you get a full time salary for part time hours. You know, we, you know, <laughs> we uh, nine to 12, nine to one. You know, if you stay extra, have to do a recovery and then you got the rest of the day to chill. You know, um, usually you're practicing or games six days a week. You know, we always have one off day. So for me, it's all about time blocking. You know, taking advantage of your time when you have time to do it. And it doesn't have to be like you don't have to start a full fledged business. I know you mentioned earlier that you your focus is on retired athletes. Um, the reason I say start now is that so when you do transition, it's a little bit easier. So whether you if you're starting over, you don't have to start over from the like from the beginning. You can start like start over like maybe midway or halfway or even just like fully transition. So for me, it's all about time blocking, whether it's one hour per week. Um, obviously, I'm doing more, but if you if you're feeling kind of hesitant, uh, whether you have family, kids, other obligations, you know, different things that you have to do, uh, one hour per week. You know, this hour I'm going to learn a new topic or learn a new skill, or this hour I'm going to connect with five people that in a field or a space that I'm interested in, and do that over time. Do that over time. You know, one hour leads to four over a month, leads to eight over two months. You know, and it just keeps going and keeps going. Um, so I think if you can time block and prior prioritize certain things, you'll be fine. I love that, man. I love that. And then another question I wanted to ask you was, why was financial education, financial empowerment for athletes, why was that important for you? Because you, I mean, you could have started any type of business, right? And I know you do some stuff with branding as well. Um, but why was finance the thing that you were like, yeah, this is what I want to, this is what I want to bring to the table when we're dealing with athletes? So for me, I think because if you look at an athlete career, you know, our window of influence is so small. You know, while our peers are going to school, you know, we're going to school, whether we leave early or we go pro right after, while we start here and then, you know, we come up, we come up and then we go immediately down, depending on if we're able to transition. Uh, sorry, it's like supposed to be a graph. Uh, and then you got the student, <laughs> like your peers that will start, start, but they gradually go up. And that goes longer, you know, you can work till, you know, you retire, which is like 65, whatever. Whereas athletes, you retire, I mean, careers last three to five years, if you're lucky. Um, if you're exceptional, you can play up to 10, 15, 20 years, but that's, you know, anomaly. So we have this capital at a younger age. So, you know, we don't have those times to, we don't have that, we don't have the time to make the mistakes that our peers would normally do because they can have the rest of their careers could kind of, you know, mix and match, learn from their lessons. Whereas we have this capital right now and, you know, with financial literacy, financial education, if we are able to maximize what we do with their money right now, it eases that transition for when we do have to have that decline and then find the next phase of our careers and our lives. So, you know, if we, if we, we invest our capital, right. With, you know, compound interest, investing early, being smart with our money. It gives us more financial stability. It gives us more leverage to do other things and not just like, oh, I need to find a quick job because um, I'm done playing. I don't know what else I'm going to do. I don't like coaching, but I'm going to be a coach. So being financially, I know I have no disrespect to coaches because whether you, you, you may like co coaching, but I'm saying you don't want to be forced to something that you don't want to do just because uh, that's like an immediate uh, need. So the reason why I wanted to focus on financial education is to give us, you know, stability, a leverage and the opportunity to maximize the capital that we're making in our 20s. Whereas other people are usually, you know, kind of trying to build their way up where we kind of have that head start. That's huge, man. That's like preventative maintenance is, you know, staying that. ready so you don't yeah, staying ready so you don't got to get ready. That's exactly. what it is. That's what you're doing. The thing about it, you know, and that's why I'm just, I'm just I know I've said this numerous times and I'll say it again. I'm just super impressed by the fact that you're still playing and you're doing it. Because if you think about myself or Joy or Katie, we had experiences that we learned from that we struggled through. And now we're like, okay, let me help others so they don't have to go through that. Whereas you're leading by example in the moment and saying, you know, I'm going to get prepared. So when I'm done playing, I'm good. And you're setting that example and then showing others how to do the same thing, uh, which is major, you know. So 
I know that a frugal athlete, I mean, every time I look up, you're doing something new. All, all <laughs> different forms. <laughs> I'm just being <laughs> real, man. Like, I'm not even being funny. Like, every time I look up, you got a new show you're launching, you know, in collaboration with someone else. Um, you know, you got the blogs, different shows popping up. You know, you're always, I mean, you got a million and one different things going on. So obviously right. from a content standpoint, from an education standpoint, you are a tremendous educator. Um, the question I have for you is, aside from the education, I know that you do provide some services as well, right? Yeah. Okay. Can you, sorry, go ahead. No, no. I was going to say, well, with the help of you and, you know, what you guys are doing, hopefully, you know, we can get some more content coming in the work soon. Uh, you know, and we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. So praying, praying I can get that done as well. That's all I wanted to say. Oh, for sure, man. We will definitely talk about that. I know we, we'll, we'll keep that on the hush until it's time for the official <laughs> announcement. But yeah. um, I was going to, I wanted to ask you, you know, if I'm a, a current athlete, if I'm a former athlete and, you know, I know a ton of people after this are going to go look into what you're doing. You already got a ton of people tapping in, yeah. but you know, what, what can I expect? You know, if I, what, what I'm at, really asking, what can I reach out to a frugal athlete for um, if, if I need some help to get prepared so I don't have to start getting prepared when I'm done playing? No, that's a great question. So in terms of our services, we do brand audits. We do ideation. Uh, one of our biggest things is, you know, I'm an athlete. How do I make money, you know, outside of my career? Because, you know, we make earned income. But, you know, whether a coach doesn't like us, get injured, you know, loss of form, that's the only income we make. So uh, we're not going to tell you, like, what to invest in or anything like that. But we're going to give you opportunities and different um, avenues where you can use you know, yourself as an athlete to make money. So whether it's making, doing camps, speaking engagements, um, affiliate marketing, uh, ideation around content that you want to build and like, how do you make money around that? Um, also we do, um, I, did I say brand audit? Yeah, you did. And so brand audit. So whether it's, you know, you need to make a logo, slogan, uh, trademark, copyright, um, whatever you need to do in that realm. And also, um, like you said earlier, preventative maintenance. You know, there's a lot of athletes that have lost money because of previous tweets, um, Instagram posts, different things like that. You know, I, I know some athletes that don't even have Google alerts. I know I might sound egotistical, like why would I look myself up on Google? You need to have a pulse of, you know, what's being said about you so you can kind of control your own narrative. You know, if someone's like writing a blog about, oh, this person, he's always out partying. It's like, no, that's not the case. Uh, so you can that's why I set up Google alerts. Um, and we also do, do um, financial coaching. So we're not licensed to do, like I said earlier, investing, but we can help you with financial coaching in the aspect of changing your behavior around your finances. So, you know, why am I spending so much money in this aspect versus this? So we'll help with budget planning um, strategy around that, you know, trying to give you a general knowledge so that when you do go to your financial expert, uh, your accountant, different things like that, you're able to ask them questions that you're comfortable uh, asking and you have a general sense of what they're telling you because sometimes they like to use acronyms and jargon that may go over your head. Um, so similar to like when someone asks a football player, it's like, how many points is a touchdown? And you're like, yo, why are you asking that question? You should know. That's kind of how sometimes athletes we feel when we ask financial experts. So uh, our job is to like give you the basis. So when you do ask a question, you don't feel like you're like left out the room. Wow. That was a great analogy right there. You know, a football player, how many points is a touchdown? Yeah. Being able to have that, like, that's dope because you're 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 being able to you're able to educate athletes to be able to have that roll off the tongue. Like, how yeah. many points is a touchdown? Six. That's easy. If you yeah. can do the same thing with, you know, what type of investment portfolio should I invest in? Oh, that's easy. I should just do this, this, and this because my finances look like this, this, and this. Exactly. Like, that's huge. Um, another that's key exactly. component of what you're. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, I was just going to say, especially as now athletes are getting more involved in like, you know, investing in alternative investments, whereas the experts will be like, yo, this is how I do. This is a great deal because of this, this, this and this. And you like they sound like they sound like confidence. So you're like, oh, yeah, I heard my other boy did this or my other uh, girl, homegirl did this. I'm going to get in it. But you don't even know what they said. So now you can pick out words and then ask them questions like, actually, this is not really a good deal because based on the last deal, I saw this the numbers. So like you said, that's what that's what we try to help with. That's huge, man, because it's not just education, it's strategy. And I'm not exactly. I'm not knocking anybody. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. There are a lot, there's a lot of stuff nowadays, even when it comes to like transition coaching and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. There's a difference between putting out stuff, uh, you know, like putting out memes or education and actually being able to, no, I have a strategy for you. Exactly. So not only am I going to tell you it's important to, 
you know, you're, you're not the guy who's like, oh, I'm going to tell you and put out a bunch of memes and stuff. It's important to invest and, you know, make sure you're prepared. It's like, let's actually sit down. I'm going to walk you through and pointing out different areas where it's like you could do this, this and this so that you're really controlling your outcome, you know, Fair. not just getting prepared, but controlling the outcome. I really like what you said about keeping your pulse on, uh, you know, what people are saying about you, too. Mm -hmm. you know, even on a collegiate level with the new NIL laws coming in and all that type of stuff. It's like it's one of those things where <laughs> you built it. Like if you build it, they will come. Exactly. So by the time the laws come into effect, you already have the track record and of, of having these proven strategies and being able to help athletes. You know, I no. think that's major, man. No, and that's um, what I was talking about what you guys are doing, because I feel like, like you said, there's a lot of people that are just coming to the space and you like you were one of the early guys that came in and really, you know, wanted to make a difference and not just wow, NIL is coming. Let me get involved so I could take advantage. So as athletes continue to like figure out the power their leverage has, it's important to get with the right people that actually mean well, that will give you a strategy and not just tell you, um, you know, tell you the basic things like, you know, I want I want solutions. You know, I want, you know, this process to these solutions, not just, yeah, you need to save. Well, duh, I need to save. But <laughs> um, no, like, so I just want to give a shout out to what you guys are doing as well. Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, real recognize real, as they say, man. You know, <laughs> you gotta actually be getting your hands dirty and actually helping people, not just talking about it or, or putting out and information helps, of course, but yeah. there's a difference when you can actually do it, and that's what you're doing. Um, what has it been like? I mean, obviously with COVID coming in, you've had a lot more time to focus yeah. on the business. Um, so what is like, I guess I'm asking short term. And kind of long term, what is your vision for a frugal athlete like in the immediate future and then long term? Nah, yeah. So it was, it was um, it's like a blessing in disguise. COVID happened. And uh, sorry to anyone that's been like, you know, immediately affected by the effects of COVID. But to have that time to like decompress and really, you know, hone in on like, all right, where do I want a frugal athlete to go? You know, we're making content. We're doing this. But as a business, you know, how can I make it self-sustainable so that say COVID happens again and like our career's over, like, would I be able to live off frugal? And right now that's not the case. So my immediate, uh, my immediate things was like, all right, how do we scale our business, but also keep the credibility? Because like you said earlier, people will try to figure out ways to just make money. And that's never been our like immediate focus. It's about, you know, giving impact and giving athletes leverage um, through financial education and athlete empowerment. Um, and then long-term, you know, I see a frugal athlete kind of being a hub. So you think Players Tribune, Business Insider, and Penny Hoarder all in one. So that's what I want a frugal athlete to be. So you come on the website, you want to learn about, you know, um, how to get into real estate. And then you see a whole database of athlete content, athletes that have gone into real estate different ways, you know, commercial real estate, uh, buy and hold, flipping, wholesaling, um, investing in RE REITs, um, so, but through an athlete perspective, because athletes are natural trendsetters, if we're telling these stories in a unique way, giving information in a unique way, people tend to gravitate towards that more. Um, if you want to learn about, you know, how to monetize your brand or how to write a book, like different ways to make money from writing a book. Um, I'm sure I'll have an article with you, uh, in there, um, other players that have write, written books, you know, there's so many different strategies around writing books. Um, so we want to have, like, we want to be that hub, that database, and then, ultimately be self-sustainable mm, that's awesome man that's awesome it's great that you actually have a vision crafted for it too like you know what you're working towards um and even when you and i connected man maybe it was i think it might be a couple of years ago at this point you were saying that that's one of the things you were focused on is not trying to monetize right away because mm -hmm. your focus is on having an impact and building something that's long term and sustainable so there's a lot of athletes tuned in right now current and former athletes what advice would you give to someone who is considering entrepreneurship or kind of trying to carve out a lane for themselves? Do you have any advice that you can share that would help them get clear on what they want to do or just any advice on, on uh, entrepreneurship in general? Yeah. So two strategies. Actually, I'll, I'll go with three strategies. So first, um, this is like made famous by Simon Sinek or whatever his last name is, but the why, like the why model, um, you know, because the why model will break everything down, you know. So, you know, once you figure out the why, then you can figure out the what, and then you can figure out the how, but you need to understand your why. So why are you doing it? Um, why, it, why would someone want your services or your product or anything like that? Um, because once you figure out the why, once you hone that down, everything else is easier. Um, so that's number one. Number two, the four P strategy. And I learned this from a, 
another athlete entrepreneur, uh, Brandon I Ian DeBajo. Had him on a uh, podcast. So the four P strategy: uh, problem, passion, purpose, profit. So you got to be able to solve a problem. Um, that's what the best businesses do, uh, whether it's Apple, Amazon, um, Nike, whatever company, um, the product or service, you're solving a problem. Then you got to be passionate about it because if you don't have the passion, you're not going to give it your all. You know, you're not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to get up every day and like write a blog or make sure I'm connecting with somebody or doing a podcast. Cause if I'm not passionate about it, uh, it, you know, you're not, you're not doing anything. And then you have to have your purpose. So whether it's your mission, um, you know, why it's important, you know, people kind of confuse passion and purpose, but passion is uh, personal purpose is like, what are people going to take away from it? You know, that, like mm. that, that motivating factor and then profit, because if, if you're not making money, then it's a hobby. And that's not to disrespect any hobbies you have. Cause I feel like athletes need to have hobbies as well. Uh, but for a business, it's not going to function if you're not making money. Wow. So, okay. Before I forget to, to mention this, I never heard anybody break down the difference between passion and purpose like that before. I think that's golden. So just in case you missed it, Moby said a passion is personal. And I'm assuming you yeah. mean it's something that like lights you up. I'm passionate about it. I enjoy doing this. And exactly. the purpose of it is how are people being impacted? Right. That's what you said. Yeah, exactly. So if I like break it down to like, cause a lot of athletes have nonprofits, like, so some people, their purpose is because they want to give others uh, an opportunity. Um, you know, you want to give them resources and, you know, have the, have the ability. Um, but they may not be passionate about it. If they're passionate about it, it's like, no, I really like getting in the community. I really like feeding the hungry. I really like doing that. So like, that's a unique way, another way to like talk about the difference. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that, that's the best I could do. Um, because some people like are, I'm good at basketball. Um, but I'm not passionate about it or I'm, I'm passionate about soccer, but I'm not good at it. Um, so I'm trying to like figure out different ways to give you the example. Uh, right. And then the last one, what was the last one I said? Uh, so to give you, you the said profit. Oh yeah. You said, oh, no, I, I, I said I, it. I, I had three. Um, what was the third one I was going to say? The original question. Talking about oh, and, um, oh yeah. And don't be a fail forward. Um, that's the last one. Fail forward. So um, I think that's big because whether we wait and wait and wait, um, I'm not sure if anyone's heard the story between like you got the guy with the bow and arrow, two guys hunting. You got the bot guy with the bow and arrow. He's like waiting and waiting, waiting for the perfect shot. And then you got the other guy with the bow and arrow. He's just going, going, going. So you got to have a balance between the two. Um, you got to know when the moments to strike, but you can't wait forever. Um, so obviously, you know, you make your mistakes, you fail forward and you learn so much just by doing so I can, you can hire the graphic designers, you can hire, you can hire the consultant, you can hire the person that's going to make the logo, you can hire the person that's going to make the strategy. But if you don't go do it, you're not going to learn like what's working, what's not, um, what posts get a lot of engagement, what posts don't, what services they like versus what they don't. So you fail forward. Man, well said, Amobi. And that's once again the common theme, common theme between everyone who's spoken so far is taking action, not waiting for things to be perfect, learning from your mistakes, messing up, getting back up, and trying again. Um, that was that was some real serious gems right there, man. And I, I want to touch on something else that you mentioned, or I wanted to ask you this. Really, is you know I talked about Nipsey Hustle in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, that's something you and I connected on immediately, just because Nipsey, you know, we both looked up to him for various reasons. Uh, running a marathon, just all the all the knowledge he has. Like he was an astute yeah. businessman, which a lot of people don't understand. Who are some people that you look up to? Who are some people that have personally, you know, or indirectly mentored you as you started out in your process to build an approval athlete? Who are some people that you, uh, you know, you kind of follow their their trail of breadcrumbs? No, that's great. So in terms of like a more personal level, or like like similar to Nipsey, because I I never met Nipsey or anything like that. Me neither. That's what I'm saying. Like he, you know. I guess personal, either or. Okay, so yeah, so I mean, yeah, Nipsey's a big one. Uh, rest in peace to Nipsey. Um, Kobe Bryant, rest in peace to Kobe. Um, LeBron James and his team, I had the opportunity to uh, intern for Uninterrupted. So, you know, I, when I initially, um, before the internship or like way when they first started, I was like, oh, well, there's a difference between athlete, entrepreneur, and then LeBron starting it because he could just throw millions of dollars at it. But then I went to intern there. I was like, oh. Nah, it's, this is like fully fledged business. Like, you know, everything's by the book. It's not just like, 
I have a lot of money. Let's just try it. So got a big respect for him even more when I did that internship. Um, who else? Um, Reginald Lewis. Uh, he's an OG businessman. Um, who else? Uh, Master P. Um, Kelvin Beecham. He's an NFL player investor. Ryan Neese. UCLA alumni. He is a managing director for his uh, uh, investment firm. Um, uh, there's so many to name. Uh, John Harris, he's the one that helped me like continue my education while I was playing. Uh, Darren Rankin, um, another gentleman that helped me, you know, kind of get my first internship, you know, as I was playing. Um, my parents, you know, for them, because I'm first generation Nigerian American, understanding the sacrifices that they made. Uh, I literally would have to go through a list. I would be all <laughs> naming so many people. Tupac, like what he's uh, what he did. You know, I didn't like grow up on him, but like I grew up on his lyrics and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that's 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 it. I really, I what really I take. Do. Yeah, I, I take gems from anybody and everybody. They can be uh, people I don't know, people I do know, uh, people that I like mentor like because i can you can learn so much from the people that are coming behind you too because they kind of see things differently too so i know a lot of people look for mentors but i would say look for mentees as well right right oh man that's a major gem right there man you got to have people pulling you up and people that you're pulling up also i feel exactly. that man that's a great way like you said you could sit here and we could be on here for another hour of you naming people but yeah. the reason i wanted to ask you that is just to set the example for any current or former athletes listening is to understand, once again, another common theme, don't be too proud to learn from other people, either directly or indirectly. You have to find people that you're modeling. You can't just be out here, you know, on some lone wolf yeah. stuff, trying to map it out on, your, on yourself. You got to learn from people and seek out people that you can learn from. It's one of the Facts. most important things you can do, no matter what you're doing in life, whether you're going into entrepreneurship or not. Um, yeah. Anyway, man, we could talk for another few hours. I just want to give people an opportunity. You've already dropped so many gems already. How can people get in touch with you, learn more about what you're doing with the Frugal Athlete? What's the best way? No, first and foremost, thank you for having me. And uh, to touch on, you know, being able to connect with anyone as an athlete, uh, it's almost like you have like a, like if you go into a club or something, you like, you get to walk to the front of the line. So take advantage of that. You know, you got a blue check mark. I never knew the blue check mark was that big until like people were like, oh, how'd you get a blue check mark? It's just like, so you have this like, you have like an MBA in like business school. Um, so take advantage of that. If you have to put um, professional soccer player for so-and-so in the subject line, do what you got to do if you really want to connect with that person. So that's a great point. Um, but connecting with me um, uh, at Amogi Says on all you know social media platforms or um, at a Frugal Athlete on Instagram, at Frugal Athlete on Twitter, uh, Amobi Okugo on LinkedIn, personal website, www.amobiokugo.com. Uh, frugal athlete web website www.frugalathlete.com uh yeah hit me up i respond within 48 hours that's the promise i got to anyone that reaches out so always willing to connect you know always looking to collaborate always looking to start something new as Taj attested to so uh yeah let's get it i love it man you heard that folks that's a 48 hour guarantee you better get in touch with this man <laughs> You better yeah. stop playing. How many people can tell you that? Most people, you know, <laughs> this man has a million things going on. He's offering to get back in touch with you. So within 48 hours, let alone. So, man, Amobi, thank you for coming on and sharing, man. Thank you for uh, this is the first of many athletepreneur events. I'm looking forward to doing these in person and actually being able to oh, know, yeah. shake hands with you and chop it up. But uh, Post thank you again for coming on. And having a oh. uh, definitely having an in-person conference for sure. Oh, for sure, man. No question. But thank you again for coming on, bro. You, you enjoy the rest of your weekend, and uh, we'll be in touch soon, as always. Oh, definitely. Catch you later. All right. Oh, my goodness, folks. I'm overwhelmed by all the gems that are being dropped today. And please reach out to Amobi. Don't take, don't take it lightly that he just offered to uh, respond to you in 48 hours. Any questions that you may have had for him that were coming out while we were talking, just make sure you write them down, and when we reach out, be ready to ask him. You know, don't, don't waste this man's time and just be like, hi, Amobi. Come on now. Let's be prepared, folks. All right, next, <laughs> next up, we got, uh, this is a good friend of mine. I really, from the time we connected, I believe it was last year, maybe it was even 2018, uh, Marcus Austin is doing some tremendous work. I'm gonna give him a brief intro, but we'll really dive into his story. Marcus Austin played football at St. Francis University, where he was a member of the 2016 NEC championship team. In September, 2018, he was diagnosed with several underlying mental illnesses, which he had been dealing with for about a decade. 
This put Marcus in a dark place, but ultimately helped him find his purpose. A year later, Marcus founded Austin for Athletes, a sports mentoring program that has an emphasis on mental health awareness. Austin for Athletes' goal is to partner with local high schools and colleges to provide mentorship to the younger generation of student athletes who are struggling mentally. Please welcome the founder and executive director of Austin for Athletes, Mr. Marcus Austin. Hey, Taj. Appreciate you having me. Marcus, what's up, my man? Hey, man. Sorry about the technical difficulties earlier. Um, I was on the uh, chat with uh, StreamYard, so I wasn't able to get my camera working, but I got my audio working. So Hey, don't worry, man. We got the little avatar there. We can see you. I can see your face. That's all that matters, and we can hear you. <laughs> That's the most important thing, man. So it's all good. Don't even worry about it. I just want to take it back to, um, you know, as I mentioned in the bio when I was introducing you, can you talk about because one of the things, and you and I discussed this when we first talked, it was you had already been experiencing or suffering from mental illness for about a decade before you were actually diagnosed. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. And then, so what led you to actually, you know, seeking out help? Because I know a lot of, for, including me, man, I probably, not only after my career, but while I was in college, just because of some of the things I was going through, I for sure was having some mental health issues, man. But uh, I don't know, you can call it pride or just ignorance uh I, I hesitated to reach out or even try to get some help or just to talk to someone about it including my family you know i could have talked to my parents easily but i didn't talk to anybody i just bottled it up um but that's neither here nor there man i just want to hear about what your process was like when you realized something was up and and what is it that made you actually go seek out help yeah great question so um i began uh, my first relationship um september 2017 um, it wasn't the best for my mental health. Um, I was with someone that really didn't care for it. Um, so it was definitely toxic. And uh, about a year later, um, in September 2018, um, we broke up and, um, you know, things were some things were her fault, you know, in relationships, it goes both ways. But, um, you know, I n started to notice that the things that I was dealing with was definitely, you know, affecting my relationship um, in some ways. Um, and then the breakup happened um, and I was, you know, transitioning out of sport. I was working an IT job, um, going through a first breakup. Um, you know, all my college friends were, you know, who were a good support system for me. They were still in school getting their doctorates and their masters. So, um, all that stuff like happening at once for me. Um, like I just couldn't deal with all that stuff myself. So I just uh, had to seek help, man. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Right, yeah, for sure, man. I think it's it's interesting that uh, the breakup or the relationship you were in at the time was kind of your mirror. I think that's an important thing for people to hear that sometimes, you know, if you're going through something, the people around you will kind of reflect that. Meaning if your relationships aren't going the way you know, if, if you're in something, a situation, even if it's not a romantic relationship, but friendships or relationships with family, sometimes those relationships are suffering because you need to work on stuff within yourself. Yeah. Right. So that's what I mean about people being the mirror. Um, and then you started it a year after you were diagnosed or you started Austin for at least a year after you were diagnosed or a year after you graduated. So I graduated um, in May of 2018. Um, okay. I was diagnosed uh, September 2018, um, and I founded Austin for Athletes September 2019. I got you. I'm sorry, man. I forgot to ask what you were actually diagnosed with. I think that's important. Oh, oh yeah, know. yeah. So I was diagnosed um, with borderline personality disorder, um, anxiety, depression. Um, it's basically a, um, an emotional dysregulation um, disorder, um, you know, with coming with depression and anxiety, you know, highs and lows and, and things like that. Right, right. And then, so what is it that actually, you know, obviously you were able to kind of get some help and start working on things to help, uh, you know, help you manage some of these things so that you can do what you need to do in daily life. What is it that had you jump out and, and start Austin for Athletes? Was there a moment where you were just like, I know a lot of people are going through this and I want to help out? Or what was that moment like where you were like, I'm actually going to do something about this to help others? Yeah, it was just kind of stemming back to when I was originally uh, diagnosed. Um, you know, I was in a dark place for several months. Um, you know, I had to sit with a lot of 
you know, thoughts, feelings, emotions, myself, and just had a lot of introspection on my life and, and my life's experiences. And, um, you know, I had to, I was kind of going through like an early life crisis, um, I would say. And I knew that I, you know, once things got better for me, essentially right around March of 2019, I knew I needed to re-identify myself like what, you know, I know football wasn't, isn't my purpose in life. Um, I know IT is not my purpose in life. So, you know, what is that, that purpose that I essentially have? And like I said, just sitting through all the introspection, you know, my experiences with injuries, mental health challenges, being uh, biracial, um, you know, I firmly believe that I'm on, you know, this earth to help provide, you know, that better foundation of mental health for the next generation of student athletes. Mm, that's huge, man. And um, Austin for Athletes is a uh, 501c3. It's a nonprofit, correct? Uh, not yet. So we're applying for that. So um, okay. given with the IRS, it's backed up right now. So we won't have our um, tax deductible um till probably around the quarter one of next year it's anywhere from like a four to six month process so wow see even still i didn't even know that you that you uh, hadn't got certified yet but even still like we've been talking about this whole time you're executing i'm seeing you making a whole bunch of moves which we'll get into you're already establishing partnerships already have an impact without even officially having your 501c3 papers so i mean hats off to you man because you're not waiting around like oh once once I get approved, then I'll start helping people. You've been helping people since I've known you, you know, and that's that's a major uh, a major thing that I don't want to overlook and I want to acknowledge you for, man. I pre appreciate it, man. And uh, I've kind of had a, you know, I guess a backwards approach when starting my business where, you know, just networking with so many people since the pandemic, um, a lot of people tend to get their status and then they scale where I've already stunned the scaling and the organizing and the delegating. So now I'm just waiting for that status and I don't have to do that when I get the status, I already have everything in line. So once I get that status, it's just full go at that point. Man, see, there we go again. Stay ready so you don't gotta get ready. Check you yes, out. Sir. Um, another thing that I talk about a lot, and this is why I wanted to have you on, aside from all the great work you're doing around mental health, not just the education, but actually forming those strategic alliances with, with different schools to be able to, you know, get those resources, make those resources available. Um, I think that it's important for people to know if you're going into entrepreneurship, there's so many different ways you can do it, right? You don't have to be a solopreneur. Um, you can build a team around you just like Margaret has done. Um, even the nonprofit route, whether you're building a for-profit business or a nonprofit business, you have to have the mindset of an entrepreneur because you're going out and you're building something on your own. And, um, You've, you've actually done that effectively. I'm, I'm curious to know, like, because you could have done this as a for-profit business and there are people who do similar things, who do for-profit. What is it for you that made you go the nonprofit route? Yeah, that's a great question, Taj. And um, just over this past year, um, since, you know, launching um, Austin for Athletes, I was always on the fence of just deciding, um, you know, am I going to be a for-profit or am I going to be a nonprofit? And um, I was, you know, back and forth for for a very long time. And I just think that the type of work and the scope of work that we're ultimately trying to do, um, it's, you know, charitable work. We're trying to help uh, people. Um, and I think that really overpowers on like w what I ultimately decide what the business should be, if that makes sense. Um, since we're trying to help people, um, I just thought it would be, you know, um, better for the organization uh, to be a nonprofit. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And for anybody who either now or in the future is considering going the nonprofit route, if they want to build something as a nonprofit, you know, I have some insight to it because I do some contract coaching for uh, Athlete Soul, founded by Miriam Glass, who's also a nonprofit organization. So I have some insight into like the inner workings and, and what the actual structure is. Like you said, just having people in place that you can delegate to. But I'd like to hear from your experience since you're the one, you know, spearheading and, and actually building Austin for athletes. What is your or what is some advice you could give to someone who is considering, you know, doing something charitable, giving back to people and going the nonprofit route? Uh, yeah, the biggest thing uh, would be getting a team um, on board. Uh, for me, 
when I launched Austin for Athletes uh, September last year, um, like my backgrounds in technology, I was working in the IT industry for two years. Um, and I was trying to do every single thing for the business, the marketing, the finance, the fundraising, um, the networking, the IT. So like I was wearing all hats of the business and it was starting to really like burn me out. You know, I was waking up 5 a.m. in the morning to do all like my posting and, you know, I'm not getting done work until 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, so really, um, sorry, Taj. Um, what was, uh, I lost my train of thought. What was, um, the original oh, question? You were, I was asking you about what is the, uh, the road been like to building a nonprofit. And you were saying that you were doing everything on your own, just kind of posting and wearing a bunch of different hats. So I think you were getting that kind of like building a team, um, is essential, you know? So maybe like a, a better question would be, how did you go about identifying the team that you wanted to build around you? Cause this is key nonprofit or for-profit and entrepreneurship. At some point you're going to need a team, right? So what was it, what was your process like with identifying what roles needed to be filled and then finding people to actually fill those roles to help all yes. for athletes grow? So with nonprofits, you have a board of directors. So um, my strategic plan with finding board members is I wanted to find someone who was been in the financial industry for several, you know, for 20, 30 years. Um, so I was able to find a guy at LPL Financial. Um, I wanted to find someone that worked with student athletes. So I found Sherry Acho, who used to work with um, University of Michigan's athletic department. Um, and then um, Danielle Berman, uh, just what she's doing with Tackle What's Next. She's uh, connected with a lot of people um, and she's going to help um, with fundraising. So, you know, kind of lean on those individuals who, you know, have had businesses who are older than me to kind of help mentor me and help guide the business. Um, and then once I had a, um, a board, um, then I needed to obviously, sh you know, because how nonprofits are structured, you got your board of directors and usually a board member serves on a committee. So we have finance committee, marketing committee, um, mental health committee and fundraising committee. So I needed to find you know, directors for my team to essentially oversee those committees. So like I said, I wasn't the one overseeing all that stuff. So I found my executive team. Um, and then underneath those individuals, I found coordinators or essentially managers, and then we have um, interns. So um, what really um, got me going in regards to, you know, reaching out and networking with more people is um, really the pandemic. Um, I saw this really as a window um, of opportunity. And you mentioned Nipsey Hussle, one of his 10 rules of success is seizing opportunities. You know, I knew the coronavirus was going to be unfortunate, you know, for for a lot of people. Um, so I was accepted that as quickly as I you know, possibly could. I didn't dwell on that. And like I said, I saw that as a window of opportunity. I knew people who didn't like technology were going to be more forced to it than ever before people working from home. Um, so I saw that was the perfect time to start networking with people. Um, so, um, and that's how I came across you. I was, um, I joined several uh, LinkedIn groups that were student athlete related. And, you know, there's thousands and thousands of people in these groups. And I was literally, you know, for eight, 10 hours a day, I was literally like adding, you know, a person, every single connecting with them, sending them a template, say, Hey, my name is Marcus. This is what I'm doing. I, we got a couple opportunities you may be interested in. Um, sometimes they would hit me back. Sometimes they wouldn't, but I mean, just to kind of show you the, the work and the, and the dedication that I, I put in, I, I started with about 1500, uh, LinkedIn followers and now I'm, um, approaching 5,000. Um, so, and that's where I've, um, you know, scaled my organization and my internal team all through uh, that social media platform. Wow. Wow, man. Hey, Marcus, thank you for sharing all that, man. Because once again, you dove into the work and the dedication that it took to actually get there. 
you you saw the opportunity, you seized it. Um, as far as like building the team and everything, do you feel like your experience with football and just being around teams, do you think that that kind of helps you as you're starting to, well, not starting to, as you're building and, and growing and putting people into place? And do you feel like that has enhanced your ability to lead and organize teams? Definitely. And just having um, other athletes on my team is just, you know, makes things so much stronger because, you know, we all, as athletes, we all have that goal, win a championship. So uh, for us, we have that goal to, you know, implement this, you know, nationally, internationally. So, you know, we know what we need to do and just having individuals that ultimately support you and see through your vision, it just motivates me to just, you know, keep going. Mm, that's amazing, man. Yeah. And is your team primarily built? I guess I didn't know this. Is your team primarily built uh, uh, of, from athletes, like people are, who are on your team or athletes right now? Yes. So um, we have a couple, uh, one professional uh, women's basketball player, two. Um, one's in Portugal, one's in Israel, but everyone else is um, a retired athlete. Um, so right now, we have an operational team of 25 people um, across 10 different states in four different countries. Wow. That's impressive, man. That's huge. Yeah. That's and, major. And they're all volunteers, so shout out to them. And you're still looking for interns, correct? Um, yeah, we still have internship opportunities, you know, because with internships, they're usually seasonal. So, like, we had a lot of people in the summer. Um, they're taking a little bit of a hiatus, just getting reacclimated with school and things like that. So, you know, if people are interested, you know, we can always make room for, for you know, opportunities for people. Definitely. Got it. Okay. Any particular, because I know, you know, there's a lot of current and former athletes listening to this who, after hearing and doing some research on Austin for Athletes, you know, if they're looking to get experience, if they just want to be part of a growing team of other athletes, they might want to get in touch with you. So is there any specific roles you're looking to fill, uh, whether they're interns or just volunteer position? Yes. So we're looking for a curriculum intern, um, a public and media relations intern. Um, and we're looking to, for people to help out with crisis, uh, mental health crisis, as well as support groups. So um, most of our opportunities are more on our mental health committee. So we're really looking for current and former uh, collegiate athletes who um, are studying or are who are in the mental health uh, field. Got it. Okay. That's huge. And um, I, I just want to be clear for anybody listening that if you're getting into entrepreneurship, right, and this is something I had to learn, learn along the way, you do not have to do, I know I've talked about being the lone wolf, but just to get experience, it's okay to join teams and be a part of a team, right? Um, and like I'll use myself as an example, Thrive After Sports, which is my athlete transition coaching business, you know, I, I was a solopreneur. And I still, you know, I'm building a team right now, but joining self publish in 30 days, right, which is shout out to self publish in 30 days for even sponsoring this event. I had to learn to be able to integrate myself into a company um, to learn how to actually build and grow and scale the business. Right. So if you're listening to this and the mission of Austin for athletes is speaking to you, get in touch, figure out how you can get involved because then you'll be around a team of people who's moving and growing in the right direction. And if you decide someday to kind of branch off and do your own thing, you'll already have that experience and those connections and you'll have a huge network that you've built. And not only that, but you'll be able to see what it's like to actually grow and structure a team. Cause at a certain point, if you're on a mission to have a, a broader impact, you're going to have to build a team. You can't do everything on your own. You know, you heard Marcus talking about, he was a social media guy and you know, he had to do this, this and this, but he understood very early that he was going to have to build. So props to you for doing that, man. And, um, just everything that you're doing is major. Do you feel like, obviously there's been a shift in the conversation. Um, I think that over the past, let's just say two, three years, the topic of athlete mental health has become, uh, has come into the spotlight a little bit more, um, which is huge. Obviously you and I both know there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, at the same time, man, where do you see, I guess I, I just want to wrap up with some advice for current and former athletes who may be suffering in silence. You know, what would you say to those athletes? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, you're not alone. Um, you know, with mental illness, it usually 
tends to come in waves. You know, you're going to have your highs and lows. Um, and for me, it's like, it, it really stems back to perspective. Um, you know, when I was going through that dark time, I could have just continued to sit there and feel sorry for myself, but what was going to change about my circumstances? Nothing. So I needed to, you know, have a positive mindset. And I told myself, Marcus, you know, the t t times are tough right now, but no, it's not going to get worse than, than this. Like, you know, it's only up from here. So I just say this, you know, there's light always at the end of this uh, end of the tunnel. Um, you know, the feelings that you're feeling, you know, they're going to, to pass, just know that there's individuals out there, um, you know, just like you, um, that want to help and, you know, support you. So, uh, you know, come and find us at, uh, Austin for athletes. Yes, sir, man. Where, uh, can you, uh, talk about all the social media handles and obviously the website is Austin for athletes dot com. Dot org. Dot dot org. org. Yep. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. And then what's and, uh, all the other social media? Yeah. So, um, on Instagram, Alston for athletes, um, as well. Um, same on LinkedIn. Um, and then my personal Instagrams, um, MT Alston, um, and then on LinkedIn, um, those are usually, um, the two platforms that I'm most active on. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that, man. Thank you for coming on and sharing. Obviously this event, Athletepreneur is about the process and talking about former athletes who are now in entrepreneurship but I didn't want to leave it out or not talk about mental health, right? And, and not have the message get across that you're sharing and you're spreading and providing resources for that. It's okay to reach out and ask for help. You know, a lot of people, not just athletes are struggling right now. Um, so thank you for <laughs> acknowledging that and, and giving permission to let people know that you don't have to suffer alone. Thank you for all the work that you're doing with Austin for Athletes. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching you continue to grow, to grow and just have an impact on people, man. So I appreciate you coming, appreciate you coming on and sharing. Hey, appreciate you having me on, on the show. Uh, Taj, much love, man. All right, brother. Much love to you too. All right, everybody, as we wrap it up, uh, I just want to say thank you to Joy Walker, Katie Spada, Amobi Okugo, and my man, Marcus Austin. Um, once again, this is the first of many athletepreneur events to come. Like I said, we're going to have these in person. Thank you for being here. There's a million things you could be doing on a Saturday. I hope you got value from it. And uh, I want to thank Dana at Self Publish in 30 Days for being on the ones and twos and making this event possible. Uh, I want to thank the entire team at Self Publish in 30 Days for helping me organize this. You know, shout out to Darren Palmer, the chief book officer. Um, please go check out Self Publish in 30 Days for all your publishing needs, business consulting, market leader consulting, all that type of great stuff. Check me out at TajDeshawn.com. Uh, the new book, Thrive After Sports, is available for pre-order at Thrive After Sports, Thrive After Sports Book dot com. Should be available within the next couple of weeks. I actually, start sending out. Check out the Thrive After Sports podcast. You know, I know everybody talked about all their social media handles, so please go check out all these wonderful people and all the amazing work they're doing. Get in touch with them. Let them know you saw them on Athletepreneur, and um, give them some love. Everybody have a great Saturday. Be blessed, and until next time, take care.